We've mentioned that the title of the Son of Man is about the right of judgment. Does that come from the judgmental nature of man itself? Once came to Jesus by night to ask him the way of salvation and light. The master made answer in words true and plain, ye must be born again. Welcome to the Bible Study Pal podcast. My name is Greg Circle, the preacher for the Church of Christ that meets in Palmyra, Indiana. On today's episode of the podcast, we continue our in-depth look of the gospel according to Mark as we prepare for January 2023's Book of the Month sermon series. On today's episode, we are looking at chapter 2, verse 14, through chapter 3 and verse 6. Jesus the Lord, and let not the message to you be in vain, ye must be born again, ye must be born again. I verily, verily say unto thee, ye must be born again. Let's get into the study. Mark chapter 2, verses 14 through 17. Eating with the sinners and tax collectors. The next apostle that Jesus called to follow him was a tax man, Levi the son of Alphaeus. Interesting connection is that another apostle named James is also called the son of Alphaeus. We see that in Matthew 10, verse 3, Mark 3, verse 18, Luke 6, 15, Acts 1, verse 13. Could they be another pair of brothers? No definitive answer there, but it's still interesting to look at. In Matthew's account, he names himself as the tax collector. So Levi and Matthew are the same person. With the first four, the fishermen, we talked about them being common men. We might view Levi slash Matthew a little differently. Levi would not have been judged a common man in the same way. His service was to the state rather than his community. His customers were viewed as oppressors from some far-off place rather than his neighbors. The wealth he collected for services rendered left the region rather than being reinvested locally. Though perhaps we should look for some similarities. Maybe just as the fisherman, he was trying to support a family. But the key similarity is seen here, and especially in Luke chapter 5 and verse 28. He left everything behind and began to follow Jesus. But back to a contrast. We see that Levi had an opportunity that we don't read about with the fishermen. Levi was able to host a dinner with Jesus for his fellow tax collectors and sinners. Of course, this made the scribes and Pharisees upset and offers the background for a judgmental rebuttal to anyone who dares complain about someone's sinful yet politically advantageous activities. Jesus ate with tax collectors and sinners, they say, thinking that this means Jesus is permissive towards sin. Nothing could be farther from the truth. If eating with someone meant that Jesus tolerates or continues to tolerate their sin, what must we say about Luke chapter 7 and verse 36? Did Jesus tolerate the sins of the Pharisees or Simon's in particular? Jesus ate with the Pharisees, but the point comes from what Jesus says in verse 17. The great physician has come to heal the disease of sin. If you're righteous, and who is, you don't need a Savior. But if you are sick, you need a doctor. Moreover, you need to follow the doctor's orders. If one cannot be healed without following their physician's prescription, how can anyone be saved without following the deliverer's doctrine? Jesus came to teach anyone who would hear, even Simon the Pharisee. Mark chapter 2 Verses 18 through 20. Why don't you fast? There's something about opulence that creates a barrier to fasting. We live in the wealthiest nation in the wealthiest time of history. Our poor, not the poorest, there's still homelessness and other problems, but our poor are better off than the wealthy of many other nations of today and in the past. This is a gift and a curse. We can only paraphrase Paul most of the time by saying, I know how to get along with prosperity, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and being filled, both of having abundance and suffering want. Philippians 4.12, sort of. We have to be told of the physical benefits of fasting to be convinced to even try it. But we should also notice that there is a spiritual opulence as well, and it puts up a barrier in a similar location, but for a very different reason. Having Christ in their physical presence was a reason to rejoice and feast. How about having Christ in your spiritual presence? Should we look at fasting in this way? 
Maybe the festivities should be in the realm of his presence and the fasting from the realm where he is lacking. Do you feast enough on God's word and fast enough from the physical pull into sin? The Pharisees and John's disciples, maybe? Judge the disciples of the Lord for their lack of fasting. Is that judgment still passed today? Are there modern-day Pharisees who are saying, you must fast? Should we fast? Test yourselves to see if you're in the faith. Examine yourselves. Or do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test? 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5. Mark chapter 2, verses 21 and 22. The new versus the old. Here's an interesting illustration of the problem previously presented. The new and the old don't seem to mix well. In the case of the outward covering, the new patch needs to be made old to fix any defects of the old garment. What good does that do? In the case of the inward refreshment, the old container cannot contain the new drink. Sometimes it's better to find a new use for the old and just buy new. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich, and white garments, so that you may clothe yourself, and eye salve, to anoint your eyes, so that you may see. Revelation 3, verse 18. I have some old t-shirts that connect me with a wonderful time in my personal history. All the stories I had to tell to explain the designs, though, they wore out. Not just the shirts, but the stories. When I outgrew them, again, the shirts and the stories, I put them shirts and stories, away. Sometimes you have to make the judgment call to forget what lies behind and reach forward to what lies ahead to press on toward the goal for the prize, Philippians 3, 13 and 14. It's good to remember where you've been, to see how much you've grown, but more important is the need to keep your eye on the goal, the target, your destination. Mark 2, verses 23 through 28. The Lord of the Sabbath. We ought to consider how we spend our days. God gave the example in His act of creation that shows there are six days to work and one day to rest. Our culture moved to the 5-2 paradigm, and I personally enjoyed the 4 tens paradigm the one summer I had a job that was so scheduled. But God's creative example also shows us to create good, to complete the job, to complete the work, then rest. But it also shows us that things will happen to tear down our work, so you have to start over again, or you have to play defense. We see it every day in our lives. Think of the poem, Thank God for Dirty Dishes. You make dinner, messing up the kitchen in the process, so you clean the kitchen just so you can make dinner and the compulsory mess to clean up tomorrow. It's a gift and a curse. When God created man, he created him with needs. Needs that require work to meet. And work requires energy. Paradoxically, then, God also created the need for rest, relaxation, recreation. But sometimes the times of recreation don't line up with the times our needs are met. What are we to do? The lesson of the whatever it was in the wilderness is to properly prioritize preparation so that you can rest on the day that God set up to do so. But there also seems to be the case for extenuating circumstances. For instance, Jesus gives the example of David and his men who were unlawfully given and unlawfully ate the consecrated bread. Though the law may not be broken for just any exception we may come up with. When God gives us an imperative, an exception doesn't cancel it. There are still conditions. Most importantly is God's conditional desire for sacrifice only when loyalty, compassion, mercy is met. Hosea 6, 6, Matthew 9, 13, and 12, 7. If no mercy is shown, then no sacrifice will be accepted. Judgment will be merciless to one who has shown no mercy, James 2, verse 13. Secondly, we note how Ahimelech still puts a condition on the men receiving the bread. If only the young men have kept themselves from women, 1 Samuel 21, verse 4. Thirdly, look at the times when the exception was not accepted. Look at God's exception handling of the erroneous inputs of Nadab and Abihu, Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 and 2, and Uzzah, 1 Chronicles 13, verses 9 and 10. Even though there may be exceptions, God is willing to entertain. They are limited and only offered by His grace and mercy. Keeping in mind that God's laws and commands are meant for our good, they were created for us and not us for them, who are we to judge which are acceptable exceptions?
Mark chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. The hands-off healing. Speaking of exceptions, in the last episode I mentioned the common practice of Jesus taking someone by the hand when he healed them. It's not in every instance of healing, but it's in a lot of them. Here we have a time when Jesus doesn't touch the one being healed at all. It's an interesting case. The Pharisees were trying to catch Jesus red-handed in the very act of healing on the Sabbath. But Jesus handles the situation perfectly. How else would he handle it? He does not go to the man with the withered hand, but commands the man to come to him. He does not stretch out his own hand, but orders the man to stretch out his. Jesus does absolutely nothing. But then again, he does everything. Note what this accomplishes. Other than disarming the Pharisees' trap, it turns it around on them. He asks them to consider the legality of showing compassion on the Sabbath. They kept silent. He tries to elicit from them a compassionate response by having the man show his hand. Not one tear. They had already judged, condemned Jesus of Nazareth. Mark chapter 3, verse 6. Wrong, no matter what. No matter what Jesus would do, he would not be accepted by those who would keep their power. In the case above, he obeyed not only the spirit of the law of Moses, but the letter of their man-made precepts as well. He didn't do anything resembling work, yet they still conspired against him. With the Herodians of all people. The point is that often people will make prejudicial decisions regarding the Christ, his people, Christians, and his church. They will call us closed-minded for clinging to our Bibles, but will not themselves open their minds to the possibility that maybe Jesus, as presented in the whole of the New Testament, not just the cherry-picked highlights, is right. In their pharisaical minds, Christians are just like their master, wrong no matter what. Let us pray that they see the rest of Jesus' thought in Matthew 7, verses 1 and 2. Do not judge so that you will not be judged. For in the way you judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Ye must be born again, again. Ye must be born again, again. I verily, verily say unto thee, We invite you to join us as we worship our Lord and study His Word each Sunday morning at 9.15 a.m. for Bible classes for all ages, 10 a.m. and 5 p.m. for two distinct worship services, and each Wednesday evening at 6.30 p.m. for another chance to study and discuss God's Word. Occasionally, we may alter the p.m. service times for a special event. Please check palmyrachurchofchrist.org or our Facebook page for the schedule for the week. If you have any questions or would like to have a Bible study in person or by correspondence, email preacher at palmyrachurchofchrist.org or call 812-364-6215. Thank you for listening.